Hello, I'm Tom Griffiths from the School of History at the Australian National University and I'm talking today with my colleague, Dr Martin Thomas, who has just won the Calibre Prize, uh, which is the most uh, prestigious essay prize in the country. Uh, the Calibre Prize is administered by the Australian Book Review, or ABR as it's fondly known. And uh, let me just take this opportunity to recommend ABR to you. Um, Australian Book Review is a monthly magazine um, and it is, uh, I think, a must read for all Australians and for anyone interested in Australia. It's the best window on our national literary culture and conversation. Dr Martin Thomas's prize winning essay is uh, called Because It's Your Country, Bringing Back the Bones to West Arnhem Land. And it's the richest exploration I've read uh, of uh, the issue of the return of human remains, the repatriation of human remains. Now, Martin, um, you begin your essay um, by taking us not to a museum, but to Aboriginal country, and by exploring uh, current attitudes to death there. So perhaps um, you could tell us something about the man you came to know in that country and about whom you write. Well, the title of the essay, Because It's Your Country, is uh, a direct address, uh, in fact, to a man who became a, a friend and a teacher to me. Uh, because he died a uh, little over 12 months ago, uh, there's a restriction in Aboriginal communities, particularly in the north and the centre of the continent, uh, on uttering the name of the deceased. Uh, this is uh, a mark of uh, respect. It's uh, a mark of consideration uh, for uh, the family and, and, and those who are, are most grieving. Mm. And so uh, we refer to him as, as Wamud, which is what's known as his uh, skin name. Uh, it's a classificatory name and um, everybody uh, in, in this community and in, in, in a lot of these communities they're divided into um, eight classificatory groups and uh, so Wamud was how um, I actually addressed him uh, most of the time in life but uh, his proper name we uh, we can't utter at the moment. Yes, so how did you meet Wamud? Well I became involved in a um, research project that actually started uh, in the uh, Australian Broadcasting Corporation archives. As a historian, I wanted to, uh, and I'm particularly a, a, a media historian as one of my interests, and I wanted to interpret historic sources uh, in collaboration uh, with Aboriginal people. And uh, I found a wonderful set of song and ceremony recordings uh, dating from 1948. Uh, they were made something during something called the American Australian Scientific Expedition to mm. Arnhem Land uh, and recorded by uh, Colin Simpson, a well-known writer and radio producer uh, at that time. And uh, uh, really it was a great turning point in my own life uh, to make digital copies mm. of these recordings and uh, to go back to the site where they were made. It's a, a community uh, quite near the border of Kakadu National Park, so into western Arnhem Land in northern Australia. And uh, uh, Gunbalanya is a place also known as, as Owen Pelly. It mm. was known as Owen Pelly Mission in '48. And mm. in the essay you describe showing a film from the 1948 expedition to Wamwood and I think another Aboriginal elder. And what was that, what did that film show? Well, um, that's a film, uh, it's, it's a, a gender restricted film because it's, it's a film showing, uh, in fact, a performance of an initiation ceremony that was done uh, for the visiting researchers in, in 1948 and was, in fact, um, a great honour uh, for them to be able mm. to take it in as outsiders, as uh, white people, a group of uh, both Australian and American uh, researchers. To get, and they got taken in into that um, ceremony, and it was, or a version of it was performed for them, and, and it was filmed and recorded. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, sort of having gotten the sound recordings, I then then managed uh, at, at another archive to to find uh, film footage, and uh, Wamud was uh, absolutely taken by it, uh, really because. Wubba, which is the name of the, the, the ceremony, um, is no longer 
it, it's no longer performed. And, and while uh, initiation is still an important part of the culture in Arnhem Land, uh, that, that ceremony got displaced by another ceremony and tradition. And uh, so it, it, you can begin to uh, imagine, uh, I think, how, how my world was, was mm. opened up to some of these nuances and uh, the fact that it's a culturally uh, evolving um, world up in that part of the country. And, and Wamwood just felt um, such emotion and beauty through, through seeing um, old men in the film yes. uh, who had been his teachers yes. and seeing you know, this particular way of, of doing things, uh, performing and very beautiful dance and so forth in this ceremony. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so bringing um, Wamwood and, uh, and his community back in touch with some of this footage from 1948 was, very, was exhilarating in some ways, but in other ways it was shocking and you described that. Yes. Also. Well, it's of, of course, I mean, it's been a great um, privilege to, um, I think it's always a privilege to be taken into Aboriginal land and, and received as a, a guest and yes. uh, to be able to, you know, learn from, you know, some really wonderful people, uh, particularly Wamud. But uh, as, um, as I began to sort of probe this story and, and, and found that, you know, Initially, I was just sort of looking for some, you know, song recordings and things to interpret. And then I found myself uh, interpreting this much larger adventure, which was uh, a, a post-war scientific expedition in Arnhem Land. And uh, one of the, the great shocks of this expedition, which in fact did many fabulous things, was that uh, uh, it involved the collection of human bones, um, really by one um, particular man, uh, Frank Setzler, who was a uh, head curator of anthropology uh, at the National Museum of Natural History, uh, mm. which is one of the major museums of the uh, Smithsonian Institution in the United mm. States. And uh, Setzler, I might say, was, uh, you know, rather brazen about this in, in, in a certain way, in that he he actually um, organised for um, a cinema photographer, a man called Hal Walker from the National Geographic Society, uh, to to film him um, pulling bones, and 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 in this part of the world, uh, very often after a funeral, uh, and 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 after a great many several years worth of funerary rites, bones would eventually be bundled in, in paper bark, wrapped up, and they were put in uh, cracks in caves. Mm. So uh, he was able to sort of raid these caves, and um, there's what I find a, a particularly haunting film sequence uh, from the, the National Geographic Society film archives uh, that shows him um, pulling these bones, skulls, all sorts of things, and loading them up in old um, ammunition boxes that were mm -hmm. sort of left over from the war in in 48 and 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 one of my uh, again very haunting memories is is watching this uh with Wamud uh sort of just on on my laptop yes. when we're looking at that film mm -hmm. and uh so um <laughs> I think in in this research was able to sort of expose him to some some really you know wonderful imagery that he absolutely loved and, and relished and wanted a copy and wanted to show other old men and yes. and remember the old yes. days and then uh, there's this really confronting stuff uh, to do with uh, messing with the dead basically yes, yes. Yeah. so we see that as theft of bones but you have another word for it yeah well I, I do actually because. Um, now it's it, it's no news I think to to most people that um, that that skeletons of indigenous people were collected by various scientific uh, institutions and museums and and mm. so forth. There's nothing new about this at all. Uh, I think from at least the 1970s uh, there has been a great deal of argument and um, agitation. Mm by indigenous uh, interest groups uh, from many, many parts of the world. And so, um, you know, that, that story is, is well known and deserves to be told, but I've, I've, I felt that having made these particular uh, community uh, connections in Arnhem Land, um, part of what I could do um, was, was, was to really investigate what it meant from, from their point of view. Mm. And, um, now, 
quite wonderfully, um, in, 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 a, in a way, but it, it, it is ultimately wonderful. Eventually, after about 10 years of lobbying, the Smithsonian Institution were conven convinced to uh, relinquish these bones. And, and um, certainly there were people in the Department of Anthropology at, uh, at the Smithsonian Institution who, you know, <laughs> were very reluctant um, for this to happen at all. Um, they've been dealing with uh, repatriation for many years uh, of Native American um, human remains that were in, in their collection and indeed they're, uh, they're required to, uh, to meet and fulfil those repatriation requests uh, when they come in from Native American communities under federal law. Yeah. But the US federal law says nothing about uh, bones that have been collected from other parts of the world. Yes. And uh, in the, Na the National Museum of Natural History there in Washington, they have one of the largest collections of, of, of human remains. And in fact, their um, physical anthropology is a, a comparative discipline. And so their, their ambition was, was to collect um, uh, examples and skeletons from, from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it is, um, it, it's something of a, a weeping sore really that um, there are so many, um, there, there are so many skeletal holdings in that collection that are from, from Canada, from Mexico, it do, doesn't matter where, even if it's mm. just a mile north of, of, of the border. Mm. Um, they've not been, um, <laughs> they've not been conceding or agreeing to those, um, those yes. requests. And so it was only through um, very deliberate lobbying by the Australian government uh, that the the bones were eventually relinquished. They happened in two, two installments, and so they let some of them go um, a couple of years ago, and then in 2010, uh, they decided to um, basically let, let the rest of these remains from Arnhem Land back. So one of the powerful aspects of your essay is the way in which you make us see these as more than bones. You talk about the importance of um, people and spirits um, dwelling in country, returning to country, remaining in country. And so you um, describe the, the theft as effectively kidnapping people, kidnapping spirits. And so one would becomes involved with you in this process of returning those those spirits to the well, land. Is this the it, way? Well, well, that's, yeah, that's yeah. what happened. Um, with his agreement, uh, it, I started making a film about yes. this. And this is a, a documentary that's still in progress yes. at, at the present time. And, um, and, and the footage can't actually be, um, most of the footage can't be used at the moment because during Wormwood's uh, mourning period, and this would be for another sort of year or two, and I don't know quite how long yet, um, just as we can't name him, we can't we can't show his image or his his photograph or or his likeness. But mm. eventually, it's going to to come out. And uh, so, sort of for the film, and and this is part of Wildwood's um, way of uh, communicating, sort of with the public, with with with, with you and me, and, and the rest of the world. Yeah. Uh, he started um, introducing me to some ideas, and he did this in in the way that was very utterly natural to him, which is to take me around his country. And at uh, one point we, we drove up in four wheel drive and um, got up to a cave and uh, he said, go, go and have a look in that cave. You said to Artis, who's a cameraman, uh, go, in, go and film in there. And, and, and we looked in there and, and, and there were bones, human bones scattered mm -hmm. on the floor. And, and when, um, Wamud started talking about it. He said, "Well, there we have there a man in his country," mm. and this was the the really critical factor that um, and and uh, he began to sort of open up something of of his worldview, and it's and it's a very entrenched idea in that culture that the spirit of a person uh, is enduring and continues uh, to live in proximity to the bones. Mm. And so uh, not just, so you're talking about that sort of theft idea. Mm. What I argue in, in the essay is that part of, it's certainly it is seen as theft. And, 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 and finally when the bones got back and it came time to 
to bury them in the ground. And they didn't put them back in the caves this time. They put yeah. them deep in the earth mm. where no one was going to get them ever. And, uh, mm. and, and, but, you know, Wamud said, you know, gave this great sort of rant, you know, stealing people's bones for study is no bloody good. But at the mm. same time, he was really saying that the, the, the theft well, theft of a of a person of a spirit is it's it's more like a sort of kidnap, and 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 they were very scared that the uh, the, the spirits had been taken out of their country and taken over to the United States, and uh, had that incredible disorientating uh, experience, and it's 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 so interesting ab about how Wamud and, and other Aboriginal people thought about that and 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 actually. Th thought about the whole experience from, from the spirit's point of view. And um, one of the most important things they thought was that they had to begin hearing Aboriginal voices and hearing Aboriginal languages again, mm. because they'd been over mm. there in, in the United States hearing American accents. And uh, so, in, in fact, the, the process that, that Wamud, partly through his um, linguistic expertise, and the fact that uh, he was uh, at least somewhat uh, conversant in a number of languages that are that have really almost become extinct, uh, possibly were almost extinct before his death, and mm. uh, uh, possibly sort of more have gone further in that way now. And so he was able to um, speak to those spirits and and orientate them um, during. Uh, an incredibly uh, moving process that um, I watched and, and, and that we filmed uh, that involved when finally the, the bones were gotten out of their museum boxes, the, the cardboard coffins, I call them, yes. in, in the F essay, and, and, and they began to um, paint them with, with red ochre. The, the color, uh, this, this color of, of the earth it's the colour that bodies are painted with um, for ceremony. And Wamwood talked about um, dressing them and, and a form of dressing. A, the, the, um, they weren't just, they weren't painted. Uh, the, the various people charged with responsibility for, for doing this would, would, would plunge their hands into a sort of puddle of um, ochre liquid and, and really massage uh, yes the skulls uh, before they were wrapped up in, in paper bark as they had been after in their original mourning rites mm. and prepared for burial. Just before we finish, uh, perhaps we can refer to the beautiful photograph which is reproduced on the cover of Australian Book Review this month. Um, and it's a photograph taken in 1948 of a young Aboriginal man. Can you explain the significance of that photo? Yeah, well, um, it shows um, a, a young man or a, a, a teenager, youth really, and uh, we, we know who, we know his name, it's Jimmy Bungaroo. And uh, so Jimmy and uh, another young man uh, living at Owen Pelly Mission at that time were uh, employed by Frank Setzler to do all sorts of archaeological work mm. um, during the 48 expedition when they were located at that particular point. And, uh, well, uh, you know, I've been researching the story from Frank Setzler's point of view mm. too and in the uh, National Anthropological Archives in the in the Smithsonian Institution, you can find his diary, and mm. uh, so you find all the, the sort of revelations about collecting these bones. And um, Setzler writes in his diary, so he's obviously quite aware um, that what he's doing is is well out of bounds in terms of of, of the local protocols. And 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 he wrote in his diary that um, he waited for his his native boy assistants to. To, to go to sleep and, and have a siesta after a long day of, of, mm. of working and, and um, sifting and archaeological type work uh, before he went into one of these mortuary caves and, and raided them and collected the bones. And so, you know, I was intrigued to, to read that, that revelation in his diary and then to find in his own photographic collection that, you know, not only had he stolen the bones. He then kind of gone and stolen this photograph um, of 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 Jimmy Bungaroo 
asleep. And um, so in, in a way that the, the sort of mystery and, and indeed the great, what I think is the great beauty of that photograph, um, you know, it was, is, was a motif and it's something that's, that's haunted me um, mm -hmm. in, in doing this research that I've come back to time and time again. Yes, well, it's a, it's a wonderful essay, Martin. It's enthralling and thought-provoking, and I think it's an essay that all Australians should read to understand our country. Congratulations on the Calibre Prize, and thank you very much for talking today. Thank you, Tom.